It's my pleasure to introduce you to Bruce Yutzi. He's um, the uh, chair of our Asia-Pacific uh, study group. Uh, he um, makes an, an ongoing contribution to the, the work and life of the Canadian National Council in Ottawa. He's been a former program director. And he's been uh, director general for North Asia and uh, deputy head of mission in uh, Beijing. And uh, um, if I may relate, uh, in, in, the, in the car uh, driving from Carleton where I had the pleasure of, of um, participating in, in an event uh, with Mr. Mulroney at the Norman Patterson School. I was saying how Bruce was so helpful to, to me and to us on things to do with China because, you know, we had a large uh, conference on Canada, China, a Canada, China issues and we we're, we're, have other things in the works and, and what a great advisor he was and I felt pretty important when, when David Mulroney said the same thing of Bruce Yutzi in his role as our ambassador in Beijing. Thank you. So I don't have to tell you who I am. <laughs> uh, so I'll immediately uh, go into a very, a very brief remarks. We are indeed uh, fortunate this evening to have David with us to share his thoughts and beliefs, I've chosen all these words carefully, about what all Canadians should know about China. Uh, there's uh, absolutely no doubt he is well qualified to do this. I've worked closely with David and know from first-hand experience that he is an exceptionally straight shooter. When, after a carefully and balanced analysis of a situation or a challenge, he becomes persuaded of a perspective on the issue, he speaks with great clarity and conviction, and I must add, courage and persistence. So when he writes extensively in his recent book on what he has seen and experienced, and what he has drawn from that experience, the result is a very brave and forthright assessment of what has been effective and what has been mistaken. He pulls no punches and leaves no doubt where he stands, what he believes. And I think at the end of the evening you will agree with me. So to authenticate what you will be hearing, David Mulroney was our ambassador to China from 2009 to 2012. Prior to that, he served as the deputy minister responsible for the Afghanistan task force overseeing the interdepartmental coordination of all aspects of Canada's engagement in Afghanistan. His other assignment Overseas assignments in Taipei, Kuala Lumpur, Shanghai, and Seoul. And from 1995 to 1998, he was executive director of the Canada China Business Council. And now he's uh, currently president of St. Michael's College at the University of Toronto, as an addendum. China's rise is having a direct impact on our prosperity, our health and well being, and our security here in Canada. The road to achieving many of our middle power aspirations now runs through the Middle Kingdom. We need to start paying closer attention. China has become our second largest economic partner, not as important as it, the US, but far bigger than all the rest. So that's as much as I will say about you will say. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Bruce. I think what I said specifically to David was, there's no one whose views and advice on China issues I admire more or listen to more than those of, of Bruce, and, so, and that still holds true. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great privilege to be with you tonight. I must also assure you as I take off my watch and leave it in a place where I can observe it, that I'm conscious that I am the uh, warm-up act for a much larger foreign policy discussion that will be taking place this evening, and I will watch your body language attentively to see if I'm going too long and interrupting the possibility of following the foreign policy debate that takes place um, at the 
uh, the, the monk debate tonight, uh, it's, I, I had a back and forth with the organizers about the timing. I was a little worried about this. But at the end of the day, uh, I, I, I wanted to express my hope that China will feature not just in tonight's presentation here, but on the stage uh, down in Toronto. I'm not entirely sure that it will get as much attention as it deserves, but, but we'll see. Just by way of explanation, because I have made a rather sudden and dramatic uh, change in my career path, I, uh, I left Beijing in 2012, uh, and, or sorry, 20, 2000, yeah, 2012, and went to the Monk School, at, and it's important given where I am now that that's M-U-N-K, uh, at the University of Toronto. I spent three years there working on China issues, uh, worked on this fabulous book that's available at the back of the room. Uh, and after three years, I thought, okay, what do I, what do, I do next? Um, I had done the things I wanted to do at, at Monk, and uh, into my office comes uh, a gentleman named Father George Smith, who's the Superior General of the Bazillion Fathers. Bazillion Fathers in 1852 were with Bishop Charbonnel and a man named John Elmsley, the people who created St. Michael's College, which in due course, uh, federated with the University of Toronto along with Victoria and Trinity, and continues to this day to be um, the Center for Catholic Intellectual Life in the University of Toronto, but also a place that has never forgotten its origins, a place that uh, has always provided access to higher education for people on the outside looking in. It was an opportunity that I could not say no to, and the Bazillion Fathers are people to whom I owe just about everything. So I'm learning the ropes uh, of academic life, keeping very busy, uh, and keeping very happy. Sometimes my, li my, my two lives intersect. I have a blog on the St. Michael's website, and last week I got to write about the visit to the United States of President Xi Jinping and another visitor, Pope Francis. I'd be happy to answer questions on both visits a little bit later. <laughs> But let me come back to my, my old life, my China life, and um, getting to talk a little bit about what prompted me to write the book. And, and one of the things that I have found, and I think this is probably true for uh, many people, is when you write a book, it doesn't stop. When you submit it for publication, it keeps getting uh, written in your head. And China has this annoying habit of continuing to develop and do amazing things. So I continue to think about chapters and extend them and, and change my views. I also must say that I really value the opportunity to meet with groups like this because every time I do, I, I'm presented with a new observation, new question, new challenge, and it again extends my thinking. So thank you for this opportunity. The book is um, really uh, about two places. It's about a middle power and a middle kingdom. And let me turn to what prompted me to write about the Middle Kingdom first. My main argument is that whatever you think about it, however you feel about it, um, Canadian foreign policy needs to take account of a rising China. It's not about liking China, not liking China. It's about thinking seriously about our interests in the world. Now, one of the challenges that I found is that there's so much coverage of China and frankly sometimes so much hype about China that eyes can glaze over as you uh, relate the most recent amazing statistic or fantastic experience that China has, has just gone through. You have to find, and I must admit that I was looking for some salient points that can make this story of China's rise and its larger significance for people in Canada real. One of the liveliest discussions that I had was uh, when I traveled out to Vancouver. We are no longer in the era of um, book tours, but I decided that I would invest in a ticket to uh, the West Coast to talk to audiences there and to get their feedback. The part of the book that really was the, the focus for 99.9% .9 of the questions out there was the rather slim chapter in which I talk about real estate and I talk about uh, the uh, Immigrant Investor Program. And th that was um, a revelation to me and, and a bit of a vindication because when I, I went to write that chapter, I wrote it very carefully and I wrote it somewhat nervously because I didn't want to convey the wrong impression. I didn't want to seem insensitive or um, in, in, in some way uh, hurt, uh, hurt the feelings of any people involved in that discussion. 
But I wanted to make the point that it is an inescapable fact that, among other things, China is home to a great many high net worth individuals who are looking to have a second address. Sometimes that second address is in Melbourne or Sydney or Perth or Adelaide. Sometimes it's in the Bay Area or in the towns around Los Angeles or New York, London, Paris, Lisbon. But it's also happening in Vancouver and Toronto. So why is this something that we should think about? Well, if you look at how it's happened in Canada, there are some reasons to think about what's happening, and whether or not there might be a sensible policy response to some of the implications. So first, we start with an investor immigrant program that has now been uh, uh, ended, but that really seemed to be offering Canadian passports as, as kind of a commodity, that if you made this investment, you'd get a passport. But what we then did was we criticized the people who took up that offer as being somehow mercenary or treating the Canadian passport as a commodity when that's exactly what we had on offer. We should have thought about whether or not there might be an impact on the price of homes and we might have thought that perhaps relying on the real estate industry as the main uh, determinant, uh, the main assessor of that question was sufficient. We also might uh, have had a livelier debate about things like vacancy rates. This is something they're looking at in London and in uh, New York. The idea being that if people are buying multiple homes, they obviously don't live in them at the same time, and that this may have an impact on neighborhoods. When they finally got around to doing research on that in Vancouver, they found that, not surprisingly, there is a higher vacancy rate in the condo district around Coal Harbor. This is a subject that city councils probably want to look at when they think about keeping their neighborhoods as vital and vibrant as possible. And indeed, I'm happy to say that in the last municipal election, people began thinking about policy responses. Not responses that would make us less welcoming or less open, but responses that would look at some of the implications of this inflow of interest and money and think about how to mitigate some of the effects namely not wanting to have our downtown cores priced out of existence so that people who aren't of high net worth can no longer live there. Finally, um, a couple of other considerations that might have come into our thinking early on. We, in this program, basically set up people to fail because we said in setting up the investor immigrant program that we would waive the language competence requirement, which basically drove lots of people into Chinese language enclaves where the business opportunities weren't that great and where what they had to do was return to China to make enough money to keep their family solvent, whereupon we criticized them again for not showing enough uh, loyalty to Canada. And finally, we needed to think about the fact that China is itself concerned about how much hot money, how much illegal money is flowing out of China, and we needed to take precautions to make sure that some of that money wasn't flowing into Canada. The salient part of my life on China in the last 10 years, and I think this is true of Bruce and others, was the Lai Changxing case, where a very high-profile Chinese fraudster got into Canada, got into the refugee system, and basically put, as a result, caused a, a big part of the relationship with China to be put into the deep freeze. All of that to say that what's happening in China is worthy of our attention and interest in Canada and should find its way to uh, intelligent policy decisions. We need to think, though, that in encouraging uh, this level of debate, we need to separate China out from the non-US pack. We tend to think of the world as made, of the US, made up of the US and everybody else. China is not yet the US and may never be as influential as the US, but it is increasingly different from everybody else. So we need to separate it out from that pack and to see it dispassionately for what it is, a dynamic generator of global trends, at once a positive source of new ideas and change, and a serious challenger to an international order that is so central to our own Canadian consciousness that we almost take it for granted. We think of it as inevitable and unchanging. The rise of China means that that international order is not necessarily uh, unchanging. Finally, it is a country that is now sufficiently influential that anything that happens there, including its missteps, and we've certainly been seeing that recently on the economic front, reverberate here in Canada. So the argument is China is simply too big, too influential to, for a serious country like Canada to ignore. What about that middle power, 
Canada. What got attention first, even before the book came out, w w was some of that admirable frankness that um, Bruce mentioned. What happens, as, as you know, is uh, when you write a book, advanced copies go to the uh, book reviewers uh, in different media outlets. And in one case, I think it was the Globe and Mail, the political reporter picked the book up off the book reviewer's desk and saw what I had written, frankly, uh, perhaps admirably, about my relationship with some cabinet ministers, including John Baird, and that became the story three weeks before the book was to come out. So Penguin, my publisher, which likes uh, media coverage, was not so happy that we were getting this media coverage too early, worried that we'd sort of step on our own story, but happily, uh, there was enough in the book that it, it was still uh, of some interest when publication date arrived. But let me talk about being specific. And what I said specifically was that I was, I was worried that the government was beginning to try to practice diplomacy without diplomats. And I spoke specifically about instances where the minister would travel, there'd be officials from foreign affairs, um, and those officials would basically be sidelined in the discussions and the uh, minister would um, transact much of his business with the Chinese ambassador to Canada who was also traveling with the entourage. And I said there are a number of problems with that. Um, one of them is uh, th there's a lot of expertise and experience in foreign affairs and you might want to put them to use on some of these thorny issues. Two, there's a reason why ministers don't get involved in the hurly-burly of this kind of debate, but wait for a more opportune, a more important time to enter the discussion. You save, you keep your powder dry. That's uh, certainly what the Chinese do. And third, by making it so clear that foreign affairs isn't part of the discussion, you basically sideline them. No smart Chinese diplomat is going to spend any time going to the Department of Foreign Affairs if they're no longer the route to anything like uh, ministerial interest. But I thought long and hard about speaking about that so directly. Here's why I made the decision to, as I say in the book, uh, violate the code of omerta, of silence, that is supposed to um, follow public servants from their retirement to ideally many decades later, their grave. Um, I, and I, I was going to talk about this in any event, but I happened to see a piece in the Globe today by uh, Konrad Jakubowski on this question of public servants speaking. And he raises some very good points, and the, the gist of the article is that um, the public service is very different now. They're out for their eyes on the main chance. They're, you know, their loyalty is, is equivocal. He talked about you know, a little bit of self-interest um, in the, the equation. But it ultimately came down to a question of loyalty. And he and the academic observer he quoted said that you know, if, if you fail to show loyalty, you can't expect your political masters to repay that. And that's exactly what I was thinking about. That notion of shared loyalty, which would indeed govern you after you leave office is gone. It doesn't exist anymore. There isn't a pact. That's over. So not talking about it doesn't really serve any particular interest other than keeping it away from uh, and out of public discussion. The government can decide that it wants to do its business generally or when it comes to foreign policy without the public service or without the foreign service but my point is, we should at least talk about it. Because if we don't talk about it, a decade will pass, the department will be further enfeebled, and we won't really have much of a chance to think about the consequences or work our way back. In the book, I lay two big problems at the feet of the government of Canada, at the political level, but also at the public service level. The first problem, is failing to engage in what I'd call real grown-up foreign policy. In this case, it involves seeing China squarely and dispassionately and thinking clearly and carefully about how Canada should engage it. This is first a problem related to how we think about China. We tend to be unable to see China steadily and see it whole as both an opportunity and a potential challenge or problem. I used to see this, and I talk about it in the book, in terms of the deputy minister community in Ottawa, the security deputies would be very focused on China as a threat, the sum of all fears. The economic deputies would be thinking about China as this golden opportunity. And to a certain extent, both are wrong and both are right, but it's the same China. 
And what's challenging for us is we really haven't had to deal with a country that is so compelling, so influential, so capable in both those directions. I don't end my book by saying it's a big challenge, but here's the good news, here's what makes it easy for us. We are going to be faced with some really significant difficulties in dealing with a rising China both in terms of addressing our interests, but also in constraining some of the uh, more problematic changes that China proposes to make to the system. But any uh, response has to start with thinking clearly and carefully about what it is that we're facing. It's not about liking China or not liking China. If I talk about how we see China, the, the problem, uh, a problem with how we see China, there's also a problem and a failure to think about China as dynamic and changing. We tend to think of China as monolithic. And that's, to a certain extent, a problem with, uh, that I describe in the book as pertaining to the pre-Harper, the late Kretschmann Martin approach to Canadian thinking about China, which tended to see China as the China of our best years together, the China that was beholden to Canada, doing its best to change, answering um, all the questions we'd pose in exactly the right way, and it failed to take into account that China had become something very different. It fails to contend with a complex and multidimensional China, a China guided by its own complicated sense of its place in the world, colored by its unique reading of history, by a profound national sense of insecurity, with a dose of nationalism thrown in, and not a little emotion. I used to if I had one issue that worried me when I was in China, it was then, and it's only gotten worse since, the state of Sino-American relations. And what worried me most was the inability of some very senior people in China to see the United States as we in Canada see it, as somewhat contradictory, a little bit frustrating source of many uh, diverse messages, but trying to, to see through that to uh, a, a more, more or less unchanging American approach to the world. China tends to view the Americans through uh, a, a prism of emotion and misperception, and that is very, very dangerous. So what I've talked about recently is, it's a bit of a, uh, a nod to, but a change from a formula that um, Robert Zellick, the great American trade diplomat, came up with. He talked about a changing China, um, a, a China that ultimately has to be a responsible stakeholder. So uh, it's, this is a powerful and compelling China in the world that also acknowledges its responsibilities. My sense is we may have to deal with a China that is a not so responsible stakeholder, that sometimes uh, follows what we consider to be the uh, approved path, but at other times follows its own path and decides that it is going to build islands in the South China Sea and put air, uh, airstrips on them and dangerously challenge the status quo in the South China Sea, uh, a China that decides that it will launch a cap and trade system but still send fishing fleets around the world to some of the last big uh, pools of, of fishery resources, a, a, a China that stands more than willing to challenge the comfortable Canadian view of human rights and the relationship between political and economic rights. In welcoming China into the multilateral system, which is a core of traditional thinking, Canadian thinking, we need to be aware of the likelihood that China wants to change that system as much as it wants to enter it. And sometimes the problem isn't so much with our thinking when it comes to foreign policy and recently, as it is with our not thinking. This is a more recent phenomenon in which foreign policy consists of playing back to Canadians their own fears, concerns, self-interest, or other prejudices. It's a phenomenon in which what ministers say is often disconnected from what the government actually does. Walt Whitman famously said, do I contradict myself? Very well then, I contradict myself. That may apply to poets and poetry, but it's not necessarily a good way for managing foreign relations. And let me give you a couple of examples. Recently, um, Minister Kenny, who is very effective at reaching out to uh, diaspora groups, reached out to the Vietnamese community and wanted to show his solidarity with a particular group within the community. So he, like the people in the group, draped themselves in uh, shawls that showed the old flag of the Republic of Vietnam, of, of South Vietnam. 
That's a, a statement when a minister does it. When the minister then comes back and says, but this has nothing to do with our policy towards ASEAN or modern Vietnam or something, we're into um, uh, somewhat ir irreconcilable uh, differences. Um, when the diplomats from Vietnam hear that, they either don't believe it or they say, well, that's Canada. Canada always says and does things like this. I used to have a quarrel, and I've had it more or less publicly with Chris Alexander, who says some very accurate and hard-hitting things about Pakistan that come from his visceral feelings as Canadian ambassador to Afghanistan. He's bang on about how mischievous and unhelpful Pakistan can be. My point to him, though, was you can't do that as a senior minister of the crown unless the next day our high commissioner in Islamabad is going in to deliver that same message and Canadian policy is changing. If that is disconnected from Canadian policy, not only is it incorrect and confusing, but it undermines our larger credibility. I talked in the book about the phenomenon of uh, diaspora politics, and that was another area where I was a little bit cautious. I wanted to uh, think carefully and I didn't want to step on anybody's toes. But I really did feel that it has come to dominate many of our uh, international engagements and, and, and meetings with our neighbors. When I was in international meetings, I would see the Americans and the Australians and the New Zealanders and others that have diaspora populations. They'd spend some time talking about that, but at some point they would move on to other business. Over time, it has been the Canadian practice for that portion of the conversation to occupy more and more space to the point now that it often crowds out the serious business. And our interlocutors are happy to talk with us about that. It's just they assume at the end of the day that we, we have no other interests. I worried, frankly, a little bit that I'd, I'd sort of hit that note a bit too hard, too forcefully. And then I found that the Prime Minister of India apparently is a keen follower of Ontario provincial politics. And uh, I did not expect to see Prime Minister Modi show up at a rally for Patrick Brown. <laughs> Let me deconstruct that a little bit because it's worth thinking about. Canadian politicians, like politicians in other countries, had been getting messages from their foreign ministry saying, don't go to Gujarat uh, while Mr. Modi is in charge because of lingering concerns about what happened to uh, Muslim groups in communal rioting. Uh, in, in fact, about a thousand people were killed. Um, in which the very least can be said that, that Mr. Modi did not do as much as he could have to safeguard those people. There are other allegations. So many politicians didn't go, but around that time, the government decided that they would deploy ministers and MPs to different parts of India to work with the diaspora community. So Patrick Brown was sent to Gujarat. Not many uh, people from other governments were going to Gujarat, so he was welcomed with open arms, and he really is a friend of Mr. Modi's. That's very true. So in one sense, he had the better instincts than the Department of Foreign Affairs because look where Modi went, look what he became. But there's something more to it. I'd say it's the job of foreign affairs to point that out, to say this is the problem with this place or this person. You can then have an adult conversation where the political leader says, I hear you. I'm taking that into consideration, but my political judgment tells me that this person is going places and it's worth the risk and we should engage. But that's not what really happened in this case because the point of the story as relayed by Patrick Brown and others is really how ridiculous the advice was and why would you listen to it. The lesson learned by the department was not to give advice like that again because it wasn't very popular and it wasn't seen as very helpful. So this useful role of the department um, as both the, the, as the you know, purveyor of uh, you know, hard truths, honest advice, difficult messages, and the loyal implementer of policy is reduced to the loyal implementation role. So I've talked about this problem of um, thinking about foreign policy, thinking about Canada's role in the world, to a certain extent, we're losing the notion that stewardship of Canadian foreign policy is a responsibility entrusted to the government in power, and it's becoming something of a political reward. It's something that you get to use, a really exotic and important stage that you can use to your advantage, uh, 
but the longer term interests of Canada somehow get lost in this. In some cases, we worried early on that people simply didn't understand the implications of what was happening. Now, I honestly think it's that they, they don't really care. There's a second problem here. I talked about the problem of seeing China as it is and taking, uh, taking policy decisions from that. The second problem is one where the responsibility, I think, needs to be shared between the political level and the public service. If the first problem was the failure to develop intelligent policies, the second problem is a manifest failure to implement policies. And if I said earlier on that some of the China stories aren't particularly noteworthy or even sexy, policy implementation is something that uh, is uh, even more boring in, and much less studied, but it's incredibly important. And many of the failures we see in this town are not from a failure to conceive policy, but from a failure to implement. The political level is at fault because failure of execution is often these days due to a widening gap between the political level and the public service. The public service is seen as increasingly alien, something to be denigrated, run against. The example I used uh, at Carleton today was the idea of an ambassador for religious freedom. However you feel about it, it was a, a platform issue for the conservatives uh, and was one of the things they promised to do. When I was in China and heard about it, I was very enthusiastic because I thought about the problems we had in promoting religious freedom in China. And we actually thought through and came up with three or four really good proposals for Canadian action, working with uh, Tibetan Buddhists, with Muslim Uyghurs, with uh, Christians who are struggling with their house churches. But those things went absolutely nowhere because the idea went from a policy statement, a political statement, to an appointment. And by the way, the person who was appointed is first rate. But because nobody really thinks anymore about how you take an idea and implement it in a very secular foreign service and a, and a somewhat skeptical foreign service, the idea never really reached its full potential. That our ambassador for religious freedom isn't doing the really interesting things that, for example, his American counterpart, and again, not through any fault of his own. So there is, when government fails to think of itself as connected to the public service, it's no wonder that some issues of implementation fail. But blame can't be left entirely at the feet of politicians. The public service has, as I write in the book, uh, a problem with leadership. Consensus, no matter how tenuous, is preferred. Promotion processes become exercise designed to be appeal-proof and routinely screen out or stultify the candidates we most need. The dead hand of bureaucratic management crowds out leadership. And organizational objectives are favored over truly national objectives. This was the challenge at the heart of the Afghanistan mission. Before the Manly panel sat down, we had two small Afghanistan missions, one run by CETA, one run by the Department of Foreign Affairs, and a much larger one run by the Canadian forces. But all of them, I would argue, were closer to organizationally focused efforts than Canadian efforts. I found the same thing when I got to China. The staff of the embassy is made up of people from a variety of departments and provinces, all of them responding to a wire that's being pulled by a desk in Ottawa. The biggest job is to create a sense of Canadian objectives and to help people in the embassy see how what they're doing contributes to those larger Canadian objectives. It was not, um, it was not easy in part because there wasn't really anybody in Ottawa who was thinking about Canadian objectives. That tendency, that capacity is no longer with us. We used, um, just as a matter of fact, in the absence of that, in the absence of any table to come and visit and sit, sit down at, we used the Prime Minister's first visit in 2009 where uh, we introduced the idea of a joint statement between the Prime Minister and his Chinese counterpart in which they would talk about the relationship and then come up with a work list of a limited number of things they wanted to do in the next 12 months. And that became the blueprint that we could show to Ottawa to say, this is what we need to focus our attentions on to get done in the relationship if we are to reach the following objectives. Why does all this matter? Why should we care about how we manage the relationship with China? Let me offer three China issues that are worthy of our serious attention. One is that managing the bumpy ride down from 10 or 9% annual growth to 5 or 6 or even lower, something the Chinese 
uh, economy requires if it is to move from government-driven investment to uh, an economy that's powered by the demand of Chinese households. That's a bumpy process. We've already seen some of the uh, uh, repercussions of that in the recent uh, problems on the Sh Shanghai Stock Exchange. That's going to come at a, an economic cost, but a political cost in China, meaning that things are almost certainly going to become more unpredictable and a little bit more harder edged. The Communist Party of China, post Tiananmen, did a very, very serious review of its status, realizing that they had almost lost their country. They, that was then followed by the collapse of the Soviet Union, which was profoundly unsettling because the Soviet Union had been the great influencer of all communist regimes. That was followed by the color rev revolutions in Europe. The Communist Party is a very adaptive organization. They studied this very carefully. They said, we're not going to have multi-party elections. You know, Gorbachev, the worst in insult you can pay to a Chinese leader is to call him a Gorbachev. Gorbachev went too far too fast. We'll expand the party, bring more people into the party, and we will continue to guarantee economic growth. So China has had that bargain since Tiananmen, but I think that period is coming to the end. Chinese people are beginning to ask existential questions about the relationship between the party and the rule of law, and they're asking questions about the longevity of the party's rule itself. So how do we protect and think about our interests while this happens, and how do we prepare for a China that may be changing faster than we realize? Are we investing in the capacity to try to understand uh, new forces that may be emerging in China, new people, new leaders? Are we paying attention to the fact that China is itself diverse, not monolithic, and home to many of what I call constituencies for change. Are we in touch with them? Second issue, and this is hotly debated, China's assertiveness, its new assertiveness, and even that is subject for a debate in security circles, but I think it's a, a real phenomenon, could undermine security in the Western Pacific, encouraging an even larger arms race, a militarized Japan, and an inevitable US response that only hastens this downward spiral. We're almost entirely focused on the Middle East and Ukraine. Those are very, very important issues. But it's quite remarkable how little we're looking across the Pacific. What's more unsettling is we don't really have a coherent policy for engaging Canada in the institutions that are belatedly beginning to emerge. Remember that Jason Kenney scarf I talked about? We haven't really thought about uh, the investment in humanitarian relief for anti-piracy operations, for training with other navies. If I was in the Canadian Forces and had the resources, I'd be thinking very carefully about reaching out to those officers in the PLA forces who are coming up to flag rank, and I'd be ensuring that senior people in the Canadian Forces who are likely to be uh, at the general officer level ha spend some time in China. Meanwhile, we seem to be losing anything like consensus with the previously like-minded, and here I would include the Europeans, on the kind of conversation that we need to have with China about our expectations, including our expectations about rights. The Chancellor of the Exchequer in the UK, George Osborne, is the China, he's, he's the person who's building the China relationship for Britain. He goes to China a lot. Most recently, he raised some eyebrows because he went to the far west, to Urumqi, to Xinjiang, the heart of this vast region, home to the Muslim Uyghur people. Urumqi itself was a, a scene of great violence not so many years ago because it's this uneasy standoff between the Han Chinese and this very different people who happen to live in the far west of China. So some eyebrows were raised. Osborne said all the right things in his speech, but one of his um, media briefers pre probably called the issue as, as it should be. He said, well, you know, we've got to be here because the Germans are here all the time and we've, we've got to just, they'll, they'll grab all the business. We're losing our ability to work with the Europeans and that is lessening our collective ability to have the kind of conversation we need to have with China. We also need to face up to two very powerful challenges to 
uh, human rights policy on China and challenges that come as much from Canada as from anywhere else. One is realism that says, at the end of the day, China is so big and powerful, who are we to talk about rights with China? The other is relativism. Well, China is a very different place and uh, they're not really uh, so concerned about some of the things we are. Both those conceptions, I think, are flawed. Uh, first of all, when it comes to whether we can have any influence with China, I talked about those constituencies for change. There are all kinds of people in China who want to have uh, that conversation with us, which also deals with the relativism argument. It comes down to having the courage and confidence to do that. So let me close by offering just a very few antidotes to uh, the fairly bleak picture I've painted. One is, I think we need to embrace a new multilateralism that both includes China and is about China, but that's informed by our values and shaped by a pragmatic reading of our long-term interests. It starts perhaps with a new engagement of the G7 or something slightly larger, but we've got to start by getting the Europeans back into the conversation. The idea isn't to seem to be ganging up on China, but to have a more consistent conversation with China about what we think uh, some of our shared responsibilities are. Second, we need to revive and restore the public service as a professional, nonpartisan institution. I should say, in this, I have a bit of a disagreement with uh, the guiding spirit of the monk school, Janice Stein, who's much more of the view that, you know, the public service, that's old think, we can empower groups across the country, think of diaspora groups, think of the Russian Orthodox Church, think of all these actors who know about the world, and let's just use them creatively. I'm not doing her idea justice. Uh, purposefully, but um, <laughs> my view is professional public service, all, all three weeds, words mean something. One, you need a professional institution that has professional discipline. Two, it is public. It doesn't belong to any particular organization. It belongs to the people of Canada. And third, it's all about service, serving the government, serving Canadians. Second, or third, we need to invest in what I'd call China competence. That is, at every level of our educational system, are we preparing Canadians for a future in which China will be increasingly more important? And are we investing in the kind of research that we need to do? The Australian government not so long ago invested significantly in research at Australian universities into the economic consequences for Australia of China's rise. Fourth, the public has to care. We have to care. If we're not talking about China, that's, that's largely our fault. One of the things that we have to get over, though, and deal with is that disagreement and debate is okay. One of the great impediments to having a discussion about China in government is fear that through some freedom of information request, someone will find out that someone had an opposing view or went to a meeting with someone controversial. The China debate is going to be messy we have to grow up and let government engage in it and contend with it, and governments have to accept the fact that that's going to happen too. And finally, we need to reconnect with the best parts of ourselves. One of the fun things about writing the book was coming upon all these examples of Canadians who, through but um, we also thought we'd sneak away to see some things that uh, hadn't managed to see in, in three years in China. So one of them was the Marco Polo Bridge, which is the site where the Sino-Japanese War kicked off in the 30s, very important historical site. The other was the community of Joko Dien, which is just on the outskirts of uh, Beijing, and it is the site where in uh, the early part of the last century, they found the fossil remains that would be identified as Peking Man. So as we drove into the site, you, you leave the sprawl of Beijing behind, you're in this leafy park, it's very beautiful, and they have the pictures of all the famous uh, anthropologists, paleontologists who were part of the discovery. Now one of the things that's little known about the Canadian Foreign Service, it's, it's a bit like uh, US Navy SEALs, we're trained to identify a reference to Canada at 100 meters through a sandstorm in a car going at 100 kilometers an hour. So as we went by, I saw the robes 
of someone who appeared to be a graduate of the University of Toronto. Stopped the car, went back, and I, I start reading about Davidson Black. So Davidson Black was born in uh, about 1890, grew up in Toronto, uh, was interested in natural history, studied medicine at the University of Toronto, and went on to study uh, anthropology and paleontology, and got a job. He, he like so many of his counterparts, he, was, he, he served overseas in the First War, but he got a job right after the war uh, in Peking at the university there, the new university there, funded by the Rockefellers. And what was exciting was Peking was the place Tokyo Black said, you know what? These, this fossil find should be developed by Chinese scientists. Let's bring in these young, bright scientists. Let's do this work here. Nobody else was saying that. That, dare I say it, was a very Canadian thing to do. And finally, Black was so dedicated that he actually died at his desk in Beijing. So he's not all that well remembered in Canada. There's, there's a sign to him by the Faculty of Medicine uh, at U of T, but he's not as well known as he should be, but he's someone who is very well known, at least in certain circles in China. These, these qualities, this pragmatism, this absolutely flat, egalitarian, anti-colonial Canadian approach, this sense of confidence in dealing with China isn't consigned to our history, but represents the kind of qualities that we all need to summon up to deal with a rising China in the years ahead. Thank you very much. We will take questions. Sure, sure. sure. Uh, Craig Wilson, uh, former Foreign Service Officer. David, uh, a question to take you offshore. I'm always impressed with how the Australians drove their foreign policy, and I would characterize it as having someone outside of government, a civil servant, and outside of, of the political level to drive a, a national consensus, uh, sorry, an all-party consensus, non-partisan consensus. And that seemed to be able to enable them to deal with the, the uh, schizophrenia of a security policy with the Americans. And, and they've driven it very well with essentially the same offer from China they, as we received 10 days later. They drove it very well. I, I always thought it was because Ross Garneau could, could drive things and, and enable the system to reach consensus. So I, I guess I'm, my question to you, with that long introduction, do we lose by having too much in the hands of particularly civil servants and we don't have a broad-based consensus? We have a lot of contending silos. Um, the, um, I think the Australians do have a, a, a better and more thoughtful approach. It's interesting. Um, I would say, though, that given the turmoil that they've gone through in the last um, 10 years or so, the bipartisan consensus on China probably broke down a, a, a little bit. The, the Australians themselves were um, surprised by uh, the extent to which, as a, a casualty of the, the um, Kevin Rudd, uh, Tony Abbott era, uh, it broke down. A couple of interesting observations. Um, uh, Kevin Rudd is distinguished for his knowledge of Mandarin and, and uh, the uh, analects of, of Confucius, um, but he was distinctly less preferred by the Chinese than Julia Gillard, his successor, who was not so distinguished, because Kevin Rudd, and I'm not a Ruddite in my views, but Kevin Rudd um, committed the cardinal sin of surprising the Chinese and surprising them in a not particularly pleasant way by changing tack. He was a little too clever by half. Not surprisingly, the Chinese prefer people like Julia Gillard who didn't surprise them. But by and large, they've had uh, a, a successful run. They've had a, a few bumps in the road. What's interesting in the Australian debate right now is the extent to which 
the conversation has shifted. And even, in, and although he's since passed away, former Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser uh, penned a really interesting piece that said, and, and he, Fraser was the architect of you know, the closest of relationships with the United States. Even Fraser was saying, we need to navigate a little bit beyond the United States. We need to position ourselves somewhere in this middle zone. We need to be mindful of, of the importance of China. So certainly you've had a leadership class that's very focused on the relationship. You've also had, I think, a very skilled uh, public service that you know, contributes to that. So I don't think it's that they haven't dominated, it's they've done their, their job. But you've also had other parts of society focused in, in on that. One of the things I most admired was a recent policy document. It's about three years old now. It no longer has any relevance, but it was called um, the, a white paper uh, for, China in the, uh, for Australia in the Asian century. And it focused first on the need for Australia to lift its game, to improve its educational institutions, to compete and be part of the Asian region. But then it got into some very real and very interesting targets for uh, people studying Asian language in Australian schools, even things as seemingly intrusive as uh, preparation for board members so that they'd up their understanding of China. I went to a presentation that featured some of the people who uh, prepared the white paper. And one of the things they said really struck me. They, they said, you know, when we started this white paper, we thought of it as a whole of government practice and, and challenge. But as we got into it, we saw it as a whole of country challenge. And they really made that work. So it involved groups across the country. I think they the Australians take it seriously because they don't have much other choice. But they, when they're on top of their game, they have everybody doing what he or she should be doing, and they're having right now a very serious public debate about how Australia continues to navigate in this changing and difficult world. And you're seeing things, everything from their educational policy to their procurement policy for their forces. This is a country that's thinking very seriously about the world around it. Okay, Abby was there first. Okay, I beat, I beat Ian. Hi, David. Abby Hi. Dan. Um, I wanted to ask you if you could comment on Canadian practice of multilateralism these days in Asia Pacific area, and um, where we could up our game, or what's your assessment? And then similarly, in terms of China and how it's using uh, the same multilateral uh, fora, what what what's happening? Well, um, I used to feel a bit like, you know, the loneliest guy in town when I was the APEC senior official because um, it wasn't seen as a very interesting multilateral forum, Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, but it was actually a very practical, uh, results-oriented forum. We're late coming to the party. We're late coming to uh, ASEAN. Uh, and, and we have some, some baggage with ASEAN. We're even later coming to some of the defense and security dialogues. There was actually a bit of a, a, a meme or a joke of, of a senior Canadian coming to these meetings and everyone, I think they probably have a drink every time it's said, but when someone says Canada's back, all the ASEAN officials have a drink except the ones who can't drink. But um, <laughs> it, it, So we're, we're, we're not where we should be. Am I uh, pessimistic about that? Not at all. We had a, a presentation in Australia last year on this, and the Australians were typically feisty and lecturing us on how they could help us, you know, tutor us and, and show us the ropes. But in actual fact, if, if you look at, for example, our performance in APEC, so APEC is 21 economies in the Asia Pacific region, um, main focus is economic issues. But it's very, and APEC runs famously by consensus. It's very hard to get consensus in APEC, and some countries are pretty reluctant to give it. What was really interesting about the Canadian delegation when I headed it was we had a, a team of very, very competent young foreign service officers, including a guy named Alan Bowman. And uh, Alan could, with his team, could sort of work his way around the table and find consensus on issues that neither the Americans nor the Australians could find consensus on. Because they listened, they worked. So when we're at the top of our game, we're actually welcomed back. And we don't have any of the baggage 
that Australia brings to it. So as much as they like to say that they know the neighborhood, they can, they're capable of some pretty major gaffes. The, uh, there are still fond memories. There's still a light in the window for us. One of the things that ASEAN senior u officials used to remind me of was that time when Joe Clark invited them all to Kananaskis, and they all got trapped in their rooms by mating elk or something. And this was, <laughs> so, but they remember the fact that Joe Clark did that and invited them. So we keep missing this opportunity. But if we were really serious about it, we've got the capability, we've got the credibility to be back there, but we've got to do it for more than one year in a row. So we're not there yet, but we're not out of the game if we wanted to focus on it. Uh, Ian Ferguson, former Foreign Service Officer. Um, two quick questions. How much attention should we be paying to the aging of the Chinese population as a kind of fundamental parameter of their their future economic growth. And secondly is, uh, I know your book is addressed mainly to a Canadian audience, but is there any interest in a Chinese language edition? I, I have had, uh, well, I'm not sure um, whether there's much interest in extending a visa for me to come and launch it in China. Uh, <laughs> but I have had one, uh, one friend from Taiwan who was talking about it. There's a little bit about Taiwan and my great affection for Taiwan in the book, but not much take up from a, a Chinese audience. Because I think I, I touch on some issues that are, are hard to deal with and would make it hard for me to have conversations about it uh, in, in China. And sorry, your first question, Ian, was it? The, the aging of the population. Well, that is a big, big issue. The, the two issues that I, I think the, the Chinese government is currently most worried about, one is environmental degradation, soil pollution, water pollution, serious. The um, North China, despite the fact that they're going to have the Winter Olympics, is as dry as the Middle East. They're diverting water from uh, the Yangtze River uh, to the north. It's an engineering solution rather than a policy solution. Aging population is the other big challenge. The, the component of the Chinese population that is working age is steadily declining. Uh, the number of uh, Chinese senior citizens who have disabilities is as many as, is as large as the population of Canada. It's growing. Um, some of the problems associated with aging are still stigmatized in China, so they don't really have solutions. There are a number of foreign uh, enterprises that are helping them to address these things, but it is a growing challenge. It's a challenge for which they're not fully prepared. It's exacerbated by the one-child phenomenon, so you have a single child with two parents, four grandparents, etc. And it's also exacerbated by the fact that labor patterns are such that working-age people leave villages in central China go to work in factories, leaving villages populated by old people and very young people. So it's a huge problem, and it's going to have an impact on Chinese economic policy and strategy where they go from uh, a, a cheap labor economy to an economy that depends on higher productivity. That's a big, that's a big hurdle to, to, to cross. John, before you start, I'm going to put down a marker that the next question is mine. Please. All right. <laughs> David, John Noble, a uh, former uh, president of this organization and a uh, retired diplomat. Uh, your comments about the public service, I'm sure, are music to the ears of all the retired and serving people in, in this room. But I want to raise the issue of the current government's investment policy towards accepting foreign investments from China, which you talked about the, the immigration part of it, but I, I don't think you talked about the Nixon case. Uh, the two years for the FIPA to be, and, and the very conflicting signals that that has sent. What do you think of that? I mean, two of the acolytes of, of the Harper government's foreign policy, Derek Burney and Finn Hampson, have been very critical, even last week, in the globe, of, of the government's position on terms of the, message, the wrong messages that are sending to China. Could you comment on that, please? I do think that the, um, the aftermath of the Nexon decision was probably as confusing as it could have been for the Chinese. And normally when something that complicated is happening, you take the time, in this case it would have been impossible to do this, but in other cases you'd try to explain beforehand, but you'd spend a lot of time afterwards explaining it. Because there was no policy framework uh, provided, we simply left it hanging in the air uh, to baffle the Chinese and allow them to draw the worst possible um, inferences from it. My own sense is 
we have to, at the end of the day, have faith in our own laws and regulations. Sometimes our own, we're our own worst enemies, where you have one level of government that's pitching an investment project and ignoring some of the obvious problems associated with it. That doesn't happen all that often, as you know. And I have faith, I, I'm less concerned about where an investor comes from than I am about the regulatory So I'm not overly worried about Chinese investment in Canada as long as we get the regulatory regime right. But what we needed to spend more time on was preparing Chinese investors to better understand Canada. One of the things that surprised me is how little homework they, they tended to do. The very best they might pull down their how to do business in the U.S. handbook and then completely misunderstand, for example, the important roles of provinces and municipalities concerns around the energy sector, concerns around the north, concerns around transactions with Aboriginal communities that might be seen as exploitative. So it's these peripheral issues before the investment happens, the, 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 the way that China engages us and who China engages with that I think poses the most risk. What we're seeing too is a shift from these big state-owned enterprises to smaller but still sizable uh, private firms whose understanding of Canada is, um, is less than complete. So while we've got, you've got to have the regulatory regime in place, you've got to have the laws, you've got to enforce the laws, there are also some things you can do to better prepare investors for, uh, for Canada. So if I may, uh, the study group heard from uh, Greg Chin uh, a few months ago on his research into China's, vent, not on the interna internationalization of the renminbi, but on their ventures into setting up their own financial institutions, their in, international financial institutions that they would take the lead on. One of them is the Asian Investment uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank, and the other is a BRIC Investment Bank, and a third related sort of thing is the development of a transportation route to Europe, so-called Silk Road re revitalization. So Greg sees these as bold ventures into the area of multilateral financial institutions that eventually could challenge the World Bank and the Asia Development Bank as well. Canada chose not to become a founding member of the AIIB. So two questions there, I guess. Are the Chinese really serious on this? Will they carry through on it? And was it the right thing for us to do to lay back on it. The Brits went in, and the Brits now get their own dedicated visit from Xi Jinping sort of as a, as a reward for it. I, the, the convoluted story of the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank is, you know, it, it, it got so complicated that um, I had a hard time coming up with my resounding no, we shouldn't have joined, but here, here's, what, here's how I got there. Um, so, China, th this proposal from the Chinese has everything to do with intransigence and policy stupidity in Washington, where instead of doing as President Obama had suggested and creating more um, voting rights and more space for China in existing institutions, Congress held it up and the Chinese got frustrated and not surprisingly decided to create their own institution. At that point, it would have been appropriate to have a conversation with China, and that's where ideally you work in concert with the like-minded to say, we can understand this, but here are some of our expectations before we join an institution. We'd like to see that there's this kind of transparency, this kind of governance. Instead, you had this unholy scramble that was uh, precipitated by the Brits breaking ranks and getting in under the wire first. The Europeans did this in the same week that China was shutting down the, um, the site for Reuters, which is you know, one of the prime European windows on the international financial world. So there's a little bit of cognitive dissonance there. Uh, so we lost the ability to have that conversation with China. By the time that had happened, we would have been one of the last ones in the door. I think we were wise to sit this round out uh, I'm not sure what kind of an institution we're going to see. I think it's very early. I still have my, my concerns. But what I would rather we did was to sit down 
with the, the Europeans and with the Americans and the Japanese and others and talk about how we're going to approach the next Chinese foray into institution building. I might just add that we heard uh, just a few weeks ago from the Director General of uh, the China Program, the Asia Development Bank. Uh, he, he tried to take a kind of uh, enlightened attitude on this and say the ADB would be working with the Chinese to help them develop the, these institutions in a responsible way and that would have a net uh, uh, benefit for the uh, multilateral community. I don't know. The other but irony was it seemed that the main form of Asian infrastructure that China has been interested in recently is island building, but that's another. <laughs> Gary. Hi, David. Um, I wanted to touch on the, the point you made today and in the book about being the last um, connector, the connector of last resort. And I'm just wondering how, now that you've stepped back from government and you know, you're totally dispassionate and neutral, if you could give some advice for, sorry, Gary Lee, uh, current Foreign Service Officer. <laughs> Um, any advice on how it can be done in Ottawa? Is it a question of the current structure of foreign affairs needs to do its job better uh, when you have so many, when every single government department has a China angle, a China issue, they want to get in on the China pie? Is it a, a question of the current DFAT-D needs to do a better job? Or do you need to appoint I don't know, like a senior level person that is the, you know, the cohesion for the entire government. Great for your views. Well, one a bit of good news, Gary, is um, now that I'm in a university setting, government is looking a little bit less complicated. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things that I have to do at St. Mike's is be the connector uh, of last resort, the connector in chief, to make sure that the undergraduate division is talking to the faculty of theology, that the person who's doing continuing education is actually listening to what our course. So th that's, that's true everywhere. You know, one of the things that uh, frustrated me a little bit is that we don't have to create or invent a, a coordinating position in international affairs. We have one, it's called ambassador. And so in Afghanistan, uh, what we did was we, we, we appointed some very senior, very capable people to pull things together and to bring coherence. And they were supported in Ottawa, and I always made sure that in any major decision we had the ambassador on the phone, even though it was often inconvenient for his time zone, but we empowered the ambassador to be this agent of you know, bringing coherence, and we made sure that everybody got behind, it was a him in this case, and supported him. We don't do that in other places. We're losing any kind of concept of thinking of, it, of that coordinating role. We think it's somehow a little bit unsporting, seems unfair to empower someone like that. That's what I meant when I said we have a problem with leadership. This is an area where the Canadian forces could show us the way, where they're very clear in terms of chain of command. They empower people, and they expect them to get on and do things. There are other areas where civilian government is more nimble and resourceful, but Often it's, getting, it's, it's empowering and making the most of the institutions, the organizations, the people that we already have in place. That's enormously aided when people at the ministerial level also take an interest in how government works and support that and endorse it and get behind it. I remember when we had just, we were doing the first um, work post Manly, we needed to change everything around. We went out to uh, Kandahar, we met with all the civilians, as I said at the outset, I'm a great reader of body language. We met with the civilians. We met with the folks in the forces who were working with us on the programs. And everybody sat there. And it was a, a long night with their arms in their, across their chests, totally unconvinced. And we went at it. We went at it the next day. Then we were joined by Minister David Emerson. And we spent an entire day where everybody made a presentation to Emerson. He talked to them. He encouraged them. My job got 100% easier after that. So. Everybody in the system has to value that. They have to understand what the mission is, and they have to empower the people who are supposed to carry it out. The other thing is, uh, another insight from the Manly panel, you've got to know how to measure success and get back and, and check on how you're doing. So it's possible to do it. We just don't really invest much time or effort in, in, in doing the basics anymore. George. <laughs> 
Yes, uh, George Jacoby, and my only uh, retired foreign service. My only relationship with China was working on nuclear ah. relations at the time we negotiated <coughs> a nuclear cooperation with, agreement with China. And at the risk of not, uh, I, I noticed that uh, the word nuclear doesn't appear in your in the index of your book, but I wonder if you might reflect uh, on Canada's nuclear relationship with China in terms of, on, on a both uh, a civil basis and a nuclear non-proliferation and weapons basis, subjects like the sale of Kandu, our uranium sales, our relationship with Taiwan on the nuclear side, our efforts to encourage them to come into the, <clears throat> more fully into the nuclear non-proliferation uh, and nuclear weapons reduction uh, negotiations. And uh, because this was a, a fairly essential relationship. I think Howard Ballack has written a book on China and he was involved a lot in that. He didn't mention nuclear in his book either. So maybe you would like to reflect a little bit of, about, uh, about that. Or maybe there's another book to be written. Um, so what's true of China is also true of India. I noticed in one of the hard lessons I had to learn about India when I was the ADM Asia Pacific, and I'm, I'm gonna say this carefully because it's, it's, it, it could be taken the wrong way. Everything we did with India at one stage tended to be seen through the prism of the non-proliferation agreement and we ended up so constantly lecturing the Indians that they stopped listening to us and any influence we might have had ended and as we were looking at India and Pakistan and putting them on the same shelf and thinking about them in these non-proliferation terms, we also failed to notice that India was becoming different, decoupling from Pakistan, re-entering the world, and resented our continual efforts to put them in that same space on the shelf. All of that to say that because we are such strong and you know, admirable proponents of certain instruments, there are times when you need to look at those instruments and update them and make them work in a new context without sacrificing the essential purpose that they were created for in the first place. I think we've done that in terms of the growth of our nuclear relationship with China. It's very difficult in doing this, in knowing and having the confidence that they will live up to their assurances. So part of this was involved in our ability, our eventual decision to, to sell uranium to the Chinese and it involved a, um, uh, an undertaking by the Chinese that the uranium that they got from Canada would only be used uh, for, for civil purposes. It was tough to get to that stage, but I think we did the right thing. I think we did something that was important for, uh, for Saskatchewan. Uh, I have faith at the end of the day in, in what the Chinese have done. I think there's a different set of issues on the table now in terms of China and um, not just uh, fears of proliferation, although it has a very checkered relationship with, with some bad actors, but what, with the possibility of a growing arms race in the Pacific, uh, something that was front and center on their um, parade to mark the end of the war in the Pacific and that featured um, one missile called the Guam Express and others that are designed to attack and challenge U.S. carriers. So um, I think we've shown um, the right degree of respect for our instruments, but a degree of wisdom in updating them. But I think we're entering a whole new area with China and uh, nuclear weapons if this dangerous situation in the Western Pacific continues to um, unravel the way it has. So. I'm going to conclude the um, question period with those remarks. Uh, I'm going to say one additional point of commentary, which is the book contains a lot more than you addressed here this evening. So uh, this was but a sampler. It, it's packed full of a lot of really fascinating stuff. And two other questions which I would have asked if there was time. <laughs> What are your views? Should we fear a renewed Sino-Soviet Entente, Sino-Russian Entente? And the other, will the Chinese do a good job on the G20 summit? Will they come up with 
uh, an enlightened kind of forward-looking agenda. But I know we're out of time, so... No and maybe. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>